saw that when when you joined the chat. It's a little weird, Patrick. You didn't catch that, but maybe grammar wasn't your strong suit. It was more math, right? Yeah, go, go. Oh no, this is uh, that's exactly how it's supposed to be right here. <laughs> Miss did good. I mean, did a good job. GFL is just a, <laughs> GFL is just a plagiarism of you know, your background X. <laughs> <laughs> Roll up to the club in my 1964 Caddy Street, ready to stop at a quarter to one, just to looking for fun. Dobra vecha, dobra vecha, dobra vecha. Welcome to the GFL podcast. I have an entire list of established gentlemen on this one. Not only do we have the most powerful man in Gerald, Texas, Patrick Sherrick, joining for the very first time in the 2023 season, we also have the elusive, the accoladed, 11 year commissioner of the GFL, Mr. Joseph Claypack. Not to mention the most athletic guy that should not be athletic in general history, Caleb Cox. Let, let's give it up for these gentlemen. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. Thanks for joining, gentlemen. I appreciate it. How's everybody doing today? Fantastic. Fantastic. Pretty good. Joseph, you doing all right? Much in past past week. So say again? Okay. Much better than the past week. What happened? Uh, much better than the past week. Uh, sick, sick kids. Ah, uh, okay. I was about Are to you say sick too? The kids still sick. Are you sick too, Joe? No, no. Well, thankfully, thankfully, Megan and I didn't get sick. Uh, but we're the kids are kind of coming over the hump now. So hopefully, this this next next week before you know Thanksgiving will be much better. All right. You sleeping enough or? You sound a little tired. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, as a parent, you're always tired. So uh, <laughs> you just, uh, you, you just, uh, you know, ride the ups and downs and, you know, wake up the next morning and deal with, deal with whatever comes next. Well, I sure hope it's worth it, man. You sound depressed down here. As well said. <laughs> <clears throat> no, no, I'm just a uh, low energy. <laughs> All right. Well, I really appreciate you joining Joe and, and Patrick. Caleb has been a regular on this show so far. So uh, appreciate you guys joining. Uh, would love to talk about all sorts of stuff. I sent you guys kind of the, the bullet points and stuff I want to cover. Um, first thing I want to talk about is your kids. Most important things in your life next to your wife and and the, the sweet Lord, Jesus Christ, of course. Uh, so, Joe, forgive me. I actually forgot your daughter's name. Can you remind me? uh grace grace thank you very much i couldn't remember off the top of my head so graham and grace how are they doing i mean outside of the sickness past you know a couple weeks i mean they're doing fantastic uh graham is four grace will be one what today's the 12th and 10 days so i mean absolutely crazy she's already going to be one but yeah, they're, they're doing great. They're growing. Um, and I don't know, I, I hear them while I work constantly. So, you know, outburst here, outburst there, you know, text, text, uh, Megan and be like, I'm on a meeting, you know, can we find another room, whatever. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're doing great. That's awesome. I still remember when I came over there, uh, last year, as soon as I walked in, Graham was on like a puzzle regimen and you were like putting him through mind games and no doubt he's, he's probably the most beautiful. <laughs> what? It's true. He was like doing puzzles and stuff, but anyway, he, he's got to be like the most beautiful little kid I've seen, man. He's just a great looking kid. Grace was about this big. She was like the size of a enlarged potato when I was there, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. you guys he's your typical like German. <laughs> Got some blue eyes. <laughs> yeah, he does. They're piercing. They look right through That's your soul. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also got a little bit of Joseph's personality. Like, I imagine Graham is probably the same as when Joseph was was that age, you know, just kind of like studying everything, not so much interacting with strangers and just 
you know, just kind of learning about the world. Um, but yeah, it, it was cool to meet them. But yeah, so that's awesome. Glad to hear they're doing well, minus the sickness, Joe. Uh, what about you and Zeke, the wild man, the caveman? Zeke, how's he doing, Joe, uh, Patrick? He's good. He's uh, running around, tearing stuff up, <clears throat> trying to kill himself all the time. But um, <laughs> yeah. Then uh, Danny's on her 41st week, so she's a little unhappy, but uh, any day now. Well, I, I assume, I just have to assume she's upset because your hat has a, a misspelling in the word GFL. I think somebody actually <laughs> put one too many letters in it. I saw that when, when you joined the chat. It's a little weird, Patrick. You didn't catch that, but maybe grammar wasn't your strong suit. It was more math, right? Yeah, go, go. Oh, no, this is uh, that's exactly how it's supposed to be right here. <laughs> Commiss did good. I mean, did a good job. GFL is just a... <laughs> GFL is just the plagiarism of you know, your background X. <laughs> <laughs> sue me, sue me. <laughs> <laughs> and what about over there, Caleb? You got Braxty boys getting some dinner or lunch, I guess, wherever you are. Dude, dude, it was actually it was actually breakfast for him. He uh he slept till like eleven thirty almost. Wow. Like he was just he was just down. What time do you go to bed we, though? Nine fifteen. Holy moly! That's yeah, a, that's like a perfect, perfect kid, right? Hey, dude, it was awesome. We got some cleaning done around the house. Um, yeah, dude, it was good. And but then he uh he got pissed because he saw Mama got a caramel from. We went to this little uh i forget what market days or something in georgetown yesterday and there's this lady that sells these caramels there they're actually really good where's that box at these things right here and uh he saw you're mama grab one. Them, are you you're not like no. doing product placement no. on my podcast are you <laughs> <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> sorry about that sorry uh but yeah he saw mama grab one and uh got a little pissed that she wasn't sharing so yeah, it, he was screaming his head off, but it sounds like she may have given him some because now he's now he's quiet. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, Patrick, good luck on the upcoming birth. I think you're pretty close. Um, yeah, super excited for you. Super excited for all of you. Still working on mine over here. Still trying to get some stuff in the oven. We'll see what happens. And uh, we'll oh, go from there. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks, man. You know, we'll see That's what awesome. happens. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think it's going to be pretty cool. Um, it, right, it'd cool. be pretty cool to see a little miniature version of yourself. Yeah, yeah. That's the craziest part of it. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, it's funny, like uh, a, couple, a couple things that I wish for my child, right? One, I wish they have her eyes, which is not going to happen because brown eyes dominate. But just imagine a tan skin, half Arab, half Serbian kid with blue eyes, absolute domination. No doubt. <laughs> no uh, doubt. Ain't gonna happen. And then on top of that, Yvonne is like five nine, five ten. She's super tall mm -hmm. for a woman. And I'm hoping that they get none of my athletic genes. And this is like a <laughs> massive basketball country. So it's just massive here. And I love it. And the basketball players here are so good, dude. They, in my opinion, they could play in the NBA. A lot of them. A lot of them hell just, came from the NBA. They just won that yeah. world championship deal, didn't they? Or did they get second. Um, well, they're playing right now. Whenever we I mean, were there, wasn't the champion? There was some tournament or something going on while me and Stone were there. Remember, we were watching the game in that bar. Yeah, you're right. What? That was the country of Serbia. But what's even more interesting are the smaller teams within Serbia. So, like, imagine uh, the the American Olympics team, but then think about the San yeah. Antonio Spurs, the Dallas Mavericks. Those teams, like the, the Spurs and the Mavericks here, man, are they good? It's incredible. And uh, wow. It's really fun to watch. You guys would love it. In fact, I would. My hope was when you guys came to the wedding, a game would align here in Belgrade where I could take you guys to to see the yeah. crowd and stuff. It's it's next level. It's, it's something crazy. else. Yeah, it's really that would have cool. been awesome to see. Timing yeah, is what Caleb, it is. Caleb, yeah, Caleb, you're right though. Uh, Serbia did finish second in the FIBA FIBA World Championship to Germany. Uh, okay. I knew that they made it to the championship, but I couldn't remember if they had won it or not. Came close. 
Hey, man, second's still not bad. Not according to Ricky Bobby. I mean, if <laughs> <laughs> you ain't first, you last. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Listen, uh, let's go over the standing. Let's start with the GFL, gentlemen. Let's take a look. I'm going to pull up my screen here, share it, put it right in your face. Um, wow, look at that. Aaron Bell in first place for the first time in his GFL career. Can we just real quick round of applause for this man? He's been trudging along for years, and now he's tied for first place. Patrick shaking his head. He's not approving. But, uh, yeah, what to do? Uh, shout out to Aaron Bell. But listen, I have to say, Joseph can concur on this next fact. He wouldn't be in first place if it wasn't for us because we traded him a player for a player, a, a few players for a player. And the player that he gave us got on IR the very next week. So, you know, I think he's working for the devil. Actually, what do y'all thoughts on the standings? Huh? And, and uh, it's, it's funny because even if we wouldn't have traded, we probably wouldn't be in a very bit, a different position, which is, I mean, that's just fantasy for you. Yeah. Let's take a look. We got Aaron Bell first, Andrew Sumner second. By the way, Andrew Sumner on, on the podcast last time proposed a 15 for 15 total, uh, excuse me, total team trade between Forever Hung and his team. And I did the same. You did? I would do the same. I like Joseph's team. Well, first of all, it's Joseph and Xavier's team, but. Oh. <laughs> I like y'all. I don't know how I don't know how y'all are at the bottom of the league. <laughs> Listen, every week I, mean, I talk to Joseph, I text Joseph every week. I look at the matchup. We're favored to win, Patrick. But God damn it, we have the worst mm -hmm. luck. Here. We're two and seven. We should be five and two. I swear. Yeah. Or whatever it is. Five and four. Whatever. Yeah. Like we just had bad luck. And you know, I look back at the GFL history. Every year there's that one team that just gets sacked on matchups. And this year it's us. You know, it's okay. I'm right I'll take a look at your team though. Oh, oh right, right, Caleb. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Pat's team is rough. Shoot, and it's it's rough and he still almost beat me last week. So that's what does that tell you? Yeah. Yeah, if silent. you bring up the standings, if you bring up the standings again sure. and just like kind of do some comparison, you can see like our team up against Kalo or looking at Caleb's and then looking at Pete's, which we all have about the same points uh, for and points against. Uh -huh. by, like within a within a few points, so I mean that just speaks to fantasy because, like, we all we all have about the same points scored and same points points against, but yet Pete's you know what five and four, Caleb mm -hmm. you're what three and six, think, and you know we're at the bottom. Uh, yeah, it's just your weekly matchup. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. If your team goes for 120 and the other team goes for 125, it's, I mean, that's basically what it is. It's just when do you score a lot of points yep. and who's, who you're playing, do they score a lot of points? And Who who does uh, Pete got this week? It's a lot of luck. Pete is playing this week. Uh, play on words. So, Aaron Bell. Oh, and yeah. He's currently, yeah, Pete's currently projected 111 and Bell's projected 105.7. Okay, but man, but but Bell's team shoot. I don't think he scored under like one twenty the last three weeks or something. Well, Caleb, this might be the first week then because well, you never can trust pro projections, but you can give it a bit of merit. I know. I mean, shoot, look at uh, Adams. He's been projected like fifteen, sixteen points, and I think the most he's scored in the last three weeks is like four or five. Yeah, it's terrible. Rough. Really bringing my team down. I'm gonna bench him this week and then see what happens, though. <laughs> Watch, I'm gonna do it, and he's gonna go off for like 35. That's what yeah. always happens. <clears throat> always. Yeah, I mean, uh, who? There was somebody else on my team that did that a couple weeks ago. Um, Hopkins. 
Hopkins went off for like 33. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the week that was the week I lost to Bill. <laughs> it's like yeah, that... dude, that's I'm the I'm like the worst coach though. I I leave points on my bench all the time. It's it's what I do. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Try to minimize points on the bench. Like if you have a good bench, that's the that's the goal. Just try to minimize the points. Some people have benches that do nothing. And all they have is their their starters. And uh, if you have a bench that's producing, that's a good thing because you're going to get injuries at some point. You can fill somebody in. But it's really about – like I still remember <laughs> back in 2012 when I won that ring against Pete, it was about the bench. You know, I put in D'Angelo Williams. I took a risk. He outperformed uh, the guy that should have been starting according to all projections and ended up smoking that bastard's ass in the final. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know, man. It takes a lot of time to look at it and see who's going to – Who's going to produce? I take zero responsibility for the, those decisions. I blame ESPN and their projections. <laughs> I think everybody does. That's why you got to use us a follow. Bullshit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to use a third party. on huh, Joe? You got you to go elsewhere. ESPN is the cookie cutter projections. Uh, there's in uh, ESPNs and Yahoos are like way different because I'm in a league with uh, my cousins and they use a, the Yahoo league and I've got a couple of the same players on both leagues and their projections on them are always different and like by like major points too is like three four five point swings and yeah there's actually man I gotta tell you I think fantasy pros you can actually choose the experts uh picks so you can choose, and it shows their accuracy percentage. So you can pick the top 10 accurate handicappers for individual players, and you can look at their list. And that, in my opinion, is a better way to go. Ah, I'll have to take a look at that. Safaz, pal. Safaz. I want to talk about this next. So Andrew Sumner, the great Andrew Sumner, was on here uh, last week or the week before, I think it was the week before. Last week I was in Rome, Italy, looking around the outdoor museum, as Patrick calls it. But the week before, Andrew was on here, and he was saying that he loved our team and he would do a you know a whole team trade. And given the fact that we're sucking lately, I think I'm going to pull the trigger live on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I already got it teed up, Patrick. We're looking at it, fifteen for fifteen, include the IRR, IR because I'm a nice guy. Uh, we're going to run it. Joseph, what do you think? Uh, <clears throat> I don't like it still. <laughs> and, and Joe, uh, at this point, I don't uh, think, uh, it couldn't, it can't hurt you. Well, here's the thing, right? We're still in contention for the, call, but, the consolation. But, Hold on, Joe, yeah. you're wrong because it can't hurt us. We still have the consolation ladder. And if you win that, then we get next year's pick, right? So we are now playing for next year's pick, Joe. Yes, yes, and no. I mean, <clears throat> I honestly don't care about next year's pick. Uh, that's at the end of the day all luck, anyways. Because what it gives you gives you a chance to pick what a top top three. I think uh, what we were third pick this year picked Eckler. He was ha hurt, you know, four five games to start the season. So I mean, it and and Bell took. Jefferson to start the season uh, or uh, this is the number one pick I'm pretty sure so like at the end of the day the pick is I mean it's a maybe bragging right to that you won the consolation bracket bracket but I mean I, I honestly I put very low value on that I, I don't put full value but I will say there is value right if you look at the data the data suggests the guys that pick in the top three top four and know what they're doing they have a better shot you know, you can't pick 11 every year and win, mm -hmm. you know, if you unless you're, Pete. Pete, unless you're fucking Pete, you know, this is the Pete tax league, the PTL or stone and have, and have Nate draft. So, <laughs> Oh, by the way, I wanted to bring this up. Hey, remember when, when Nate drafted for me, Joseph said, I got more texts saying that was unfair, blah, blah, blah. Joseph live on the pod. When Stone had Nate draft for him, how many texts did you get? Well, I got very few because everyone was in the room. Um, and we weren't I, happy about it, okay? I mean, we were not happy about it. All right. Not at all. 
I'm not going to say it's because yeah, it, it's exactly. color my skin. So, I mean, I, everyone got the, you know, the, everyone had the same sentiment, but I mean, we, we've done this before. We knew what was expected. We knew whoever he was drafting, drafting for, you know, was probably going to get a one up um, because Nate is, is good at drafting. I mean, I, I give him credit, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, I mean, what do you do when somebody misses? You know, should they have the responsibility to queue up their players and, and try to select that way? Or, uh, I mean, we do the best to, you know, find a date that works for everyone, but I know that's difficult in, you know, adult life. So, I, I mean, there's not a good answer. Can I have Nate draft my team next year? <laughs> queue them up. No, you know what I think right. the answer is, Patrick. We just get Pat. We we get Nate into the league, and then nobody can have Nate draft their teams. But I Ooh. I know what you're thinking, and we're all thinking this. Listen, I, personally, I don't want Nate in the league because I think he's going to dominate. It's going to be Pete times I don't know, uh, some sort of steroid. That's going to be Nate. But look, you know what to do. Clearly, there's people on a different league than us, different level rather. Yeah, Pat and I play with Nate in my brother's league, uh, which is an auction league. And uh, James and I have essentially figured out his strategy on how he approaches the league every year now. Uh, but, I mean, he's he's good. He won last year. Uh, I mean, there that league is wide open, so everyone, you know, he has another chance to be in the playoffs and give him a chance to win again this year. So, yeah, uh, I my vote would be, you know, no against adding Nate because I, uh, to preserve the integrity of, you know, what we've established and keeping it, you know, with with our friends, uh, you know, I I just don't I don't want to I don't want to give into that yet. What do you think, Pat? Uh, I'm not totally against it. But if we're going to try and add people, I would try and add other people before uh, adding him. It's it's basically like adding another Pete to the league. And, uh, yeah, it's another person I can donate my money to. What do you think, Caleb? <laughs> uh, that's well said. Uh, I I don't need somebody else stealing my money. <laughs> I'm I'm fine giving it to you guys, but somebody else is gonna have three championships in twelve years is that's that's tough to play against. I mean, that two guys taking half the championships every ten years that's tough. I would like to add somebody. Um, I know somebody proposed, uh, like Jesse, adding somebody from our friends group that maybe some of us don't talk to um, that much, adding them in, seeing, um, you know, if we can get them uh, more involved and actually talk to them, reconnect a little bit. I like that. I like that. So we're talking Jesse yeah. Mariano. Like let's let's look back, right? We we brought in Ramos. I thought that was awesome, right? Yeah, now, I thought that was awesome. Yeah, more more connected with Ramos. Jesse Floriano would be a good candidate. Maybe even a, a stretch candidate, Andrew Crane, or I, uh, he was in my oh. head. He was in my head because he comes into the Exxon every once in a while. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So it, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if he actually pays attention to football. No, not a, not but a clue. If he doesn't, and he's willing to join, even better. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> take 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 a man's money. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's, not a lot of money, money, that's but... uh, it's like a it's like a spot a Spotify membership yearly. It's like a hundred bucks. No, it's not. Hey, yeah, yeah. Netflix. <clears throat> yeah, I would. I'd be. I'd be all for Andrew Crane because I, you know, personally, I spent a lot of time with Andrew Crane back in the Ooh. day. So did Brody. Go ahead, Caleb. I was gonna say Ramos plays golf with him still. They go golfing every now and then. So shit, that's that's another connection back. i I'm down for that. All right. I'll tell you what, I'll reach out to Andrew. 
to see if he wants to join next year, in fact. Now, uh, next thing I want to talk about, guys, Patrick, you put in the time, 30 years of fan loyalty. The, the Rangers. And, dude, I, we were pumped over here in, in Serbia, believe it or not, in my household anyway. The Rangers won the World Series. I It came out of nowhere to me because all I've been hearing about not being able to watch uh, sports because of time zones was the Astros. They were just dominating, dominating, dominating. And then, uh, yeah, then the Rangers made the World Series. And then it felt like three days later they they actually won it. So what was it like, man, you've been, you've been a, such a loyal supporter for so long, as long as I can remember. And what were you doing when you when they won the game? And how are you feeling, man? Uh, so I was uh, at my house and watching it with Danny. And she's a big Rangers fan, too. So, um, yeah, it was awesome. It was the whole way they got into the playoffs. If they would have lost one more game, they wouldn't even have made it into the playoffs. And so... The whole season was kind of a roller coaster going from first place to then third place um, with like 20 something games left. And so then just getting into the playoffs, I mean, that that was huge because they hadn't been there in so long. And then they had an easy ride all the way until the Astros. And uh, yeah, I didn't think that they were going to they're going to pull it off, but, uh, I didn't either. Yep. They won, uh, yeah, they won all them games, uh, in Houston, four of them, I think. Yeah. Mm. Four of them. So which y'all still lost three at home too. So that's still just as bad, but yeah, to lose four at home, man, that's just off in the way they lost them. Just, yeah. They like they they didn't just lose. They got their asses stopped at home. Like, yeah. just, except for one, I think one game it was kind of close, but the other three just by like six or seven runs minimum. Hey, yep. hey, what are these reports about Houston cheating again? They had like recording devices in the Rangers dugout. Is that true? You guys haven't heard? Uh, of that? I, I I haven't heard of it. I I'm oh, about wow. to say that's the first I've heard of that. Yeah. But the, the Rangers didn't lose didn't lose a road game the entire postseason, which is insane. How, how are you better yeah, on the road than at home? I don't I don't get that. <laughs> the Rangers in Houston were both. Yeah, but uh, no, it was it was awesome. Um, so when they lost it back in 2010, 2011, like. That's when I really followed them, and I, I, I don't know. I must just have uh, cared about sports a lot more. Uh, it was a bigger aspect of my life. So it was awesome. Then again, it when you like once you have kids and priorities are different, it's it, it's a different level of uh, gratitude feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool, but I wouldn't have been like, even if they would have lost it, I wouldn't have been nearly as mad as I would have been when they lost it back in the day. Which they did, they did lose it back in the day. I remember they went to the World Series once before, right? Dusty Baker. They went back to back years, they, uh, the Rangers went to the World Series and lost it. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. All right, Patrick, well, I got you speaking. Um, so, the guy that uh, officiated my wedding, Frank Haw from the Netherlands, uh, he did a lot of research into <laughs> my past. And I think he called you guys and, and, you know, talked to some of you folks. And he, before I said I do, while I was standing up there holding Ivana's hands, he brought up the story, which I completely forgot about, of the mustard tornado. But as soon as he said it, I said, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that story. And uh, yeah, so it was told in front of my entire wedding. Nobody really knew what it, what it was about, except for the people that know the title, Mustard Tornado. And so I <laughs> wanted, if you could, take a couple seconds here. Tell us a story from your perspective of the Mustard Tornado in the bathroom. <clears throat> at the, I believe it was middle school, maybe high school. I can't remember. It was middle school. Um, yeah, I was just in the bathroom. 
uh, pissing in the stall and uh, Xavier runs in. And I can't remember exactly what you said. You may have said mustard tornado, but you had a bottle of mustard and then you just start doing a 360, spinning around, uh, slinging mustard everywhere. And it got all over my clothes. And I was, I think that's when back when we weren't really that great of friends. And uh, that may have been one of the reasons why. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was, that was crazy. Just one of the crazy things I think, yeah you're known for from back in the day <laughs> what did how did how did you clean it off that's mustard you can't really clean it off you just, just kind of smear it into your shorts <laughs> here's what i remember i didn't know patrick was in the bathroom i didn't know he was in the stall and so i run in and i have i believe two mustard bottles and i squeeze them and i start spinning around and it's going all over the walls. And I love to deface the bathrooms because I didn't have to clean it up. It was a great time every time. And I remember Patrick coming. And by the way, this was at the time where like I had the utmost respect for, for Patrick. I really wanted to be Patrick's friend. And so he comes out of the back stall. And, you know, back in the day, Patrick only wore like basketball shorts, like really nice mm -hmm. expensive basketball shorts. They were like fancy. And he comes out and on the back of his leg, just at the lower cuff of the basketball short was a yellow line, maybe two. And I was like, I was terrified. I was like, Patrick, I am so, I didn't even know you were in here for God's sakes. I thought this bathroom was empty. And uh, yeah, I felt so bad about it. But luckily Patrick didn't punch me in the face and knock my block off, which he totally had the right to do. Um, so yeah, that's, it's so funny though, that it surfaced like, I don't know, 25 years later, 20 years later uh, at my freaking wedding. It was hilarious <laughs> to me. I was going to say, you should have been terrified. He was twice your size. So yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was just, that, that was very funny. So anyway, I love how these uh, little stories, people remember the stories and other people forget, especially the main characters of the story. They forget the story. <laughs> I did. I could not, you know, remember that story, but it came up at my wedding and I was like, holy moly, mustard tornado. Who the hell? And I looked at Frank. I was like, who the hell told you about that? Was it you, Patrick, or was it Brody or somebody else? Man, I don't think I told him about that. It it was Stone. It was Stone. Uh, stone. It was stone. We. It was. Um, was it the Bachelor night? I think he may have told it after, like when we were riding the boat back to that bar, or to that club that was on the water. I think that he may have been telling him it then. Gotcha. Okay. I thought maybe he retrieved it, retrieved off like some research phone call. But all right, no, reasons. Stone Stone was drunk and having a good time. So yeah. <laughs> Stone had a good time in Serbia. Oh, he definitely did, man. We all did. It was it was definitely a good time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I it was amazing. Thank you guys for coming. Um, all right, let's shift. Let's shift gears. Boom, boom, boom. Joseph Claypack, now is your time to shine. We want to get updates on all sorts of stuff. My first question for you, Joseph. Um, you've been running this league for 11 years and I don't think there's a person in this league, even people that have left this league, like Brody, that would say you haven't done a great job. You've been an amazing commissioner. You do it in your free time. You take $0 for it, which I think we should, uh, I said at the last podcast, I think you should have a free buy-in for whatever that's worth. Uh, I'll second that. Yeah, I think you shouldn't have to pay just because of the amount of time you put into it. I have many questions for you. I'm very curious about your process. But the first question I have, your general experience as a successful 11-year commissioner, not one person has said we should get rid of Joseph, which I think in a lot of leagues that has happened, right? Um, so what's it like running the greatest fantasy football league the world has ever seen? So, I mean, it's, uh, I love it. I love it. And <clears throat> It's really easy at the end of the day because I mean, y'all are all in it, so I know y'all. I don't. I don't have to feel like I'm, you know, crossing any boundaries or anything. Um, you know, we can banter with each other and make fun of each other, and for the most part, uh, you know, we don't. We don't get too butt hurt. I know there's some occurrences, but those won't be mentioned. Um, <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> but uh, no i mean the first the first full year first few years were, were i mean the probably the toughest just 
helped because I think that's when we had the largest fluctuation and just making sure we had commitment um, to make it through the end of the season. Uh, and then once we got past, past that and we kind of got, you know, the core group, I mean, it's really been, been easy. And I mean, outside of, you know, the typical annual voting of changes and all that, I mean, to me, it's fun. It's annoying when, you know, people can't follow directions, but I mean, we always get to end result. So I, I don't know. I enjoy it. I'm, you know, anal, I'm a perfectionist. So this speaks to, you know, those qualities. And uh, I don't know, I, I hope we can just keep this going for many more years. Well, we're definitely on that track, Joseph. We're definitely on that track. You've done a great job. Yes. We all think, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, when, when we all started this, did we all select Joseph to be the commissioner? Or how exactly did that happen? I can't even remember. Do you remember Joseph? <laughs> Joseph, no. <laughs> Mm -hmm. this, 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 yeah. this, speaks to, this speaks to our age right I there. Thought, Nobody can remember thought, shit. <laughs> no, I think, so I think what happened, and I, uh, so I thought Cam was running some, the league like before. And, and, and that's why we started with like KC uh, and, and some of, you know, some of those guys. And I, I don't know how, you know, how I got picked, how, whatever, but so someone said, Hey, do you want to do this? And I said, sure. Sounds good. And that's kind of just how it, I think how it all began. Man, that that's crazy. Yeah. Whoever, whoever it was, they did a good job because none of us could, uh, could run this league like you. Not in that's the league. Compliment. Well, no, yeah, well, I think everybody agrees, but I think I do remember that. Well, season. Appreciate, you know, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, you're kind of the manager. So I think I can you guys hear me? I think I remember that season. Cameron was commish. It was it was a bit all over the place. And then next year we had Joseph. It's been smooth sailing since. Because in you know, from my recollection, recollection, Joseph will lay down the hammer when need be. You know, he'll make a decision instead of, you know, playing to both sides. Hey Joe, throughout the 11 years, what's like been the biggest controversy you had to deal with? I mean, I, I think, I mean, well, I'll, I'll go three, three things. So <clears throat> I think, you know, the top one is probably, you know, my trade to you and having to, you know, you know, take, take that back. I mean, obviously I was game, you know, gaming, gaming a little bit there, taking advantage of an injury. Um, so, I mean, that was probably the biggest controversy because, is, you know, it created some, you know, you know, some bad vibes out of that because, you know, Xavier, you got the worst of it. But anyways, uh, you know, commission, <laughs> commission just, you know, run the league and I, I went back on it. I knew what I knew. I knew what I was doing. Um, <laughs> second is probably. Probably last year, last year in the whole, you know, uh, Cincinnati mm. Buffalo game where we had to figure out like what what are we doing? on on the championship um or and, and to resolve that because i mean i mean we you you don't have a game stop in the middle and you know have to figure out how are you going to you know count points for these players so that was i would say the second and the third uh was just covid football because you randomly is that you know tested and then what you know what do you do and uh, you know, thankfully, I've researched enough to figure out a kind of procedure around that. Um, and, you know, I think that year was probably the, the biggest work that I, you know, had just to make sure, uh, you know, everyone had a potential backup player if someone, you know, for someone that tested positive. Um, but, yeah, I mean, those are kind of the three biggest, like, controversies or just, like, challenges as being commissioner. Yeah, and, and throughout your time, I mean, you've made changes – you've always proposed changes. I assume they came from your own analysis and looking at the league. What scoring change or rule change do you feel like has had the biggest impact on the league? I mean, probably uh, changing the defense scoring where, you know, you're not starting at 10 points. 
um, right out the gate. And it's really based off, you know, the defense's performance from a, like, really a turnover perspective or, I guess, a, you know, sacks the defensive. I mean, you could go back and forth on that, on whether we should start at, you know, 10 points for zero because there is, you know, if a defense actually holds a team to, to zero, there should be something. But I haven't found a good workaround um, with that that I, that I like. Um, but, yeah, I mean – the changes are a combination of my own research analysis, but also just, you know, taking it from, from the uh, league. I mean, everyone has their own suggestions and try to incorporate, incorporate it where, where possible. Um, but I mean, I, I definitely would like to make some significant changes, but I, I don't, I'm, I'm really going like, you know, mainstream with some of the changes, which I don't think people would like. I think you shouldn't be shy to at least propose them. I think the league is actually open to change quite a bit. In fact, on the last podcast, Joe, we talked about having a separate league where we do experimental stuff. Like, um, you know, Andrew was talking about this. Uh, how did he put it? There's a league where guillotine. every time you lose, yeah, guillotine league. Thank you very much. That's the title of it. Every time you lose, um, you're out essentially. And then all your players mm -hmm. are drafted to free agency. Well, we could try it. What do you think, Pat? I have no idea. I have, don't know anything about it. But what's uh, the one that Stone proposed, Joe, that you sent in the group chat? The one where you have to so that's, you have to trade players. Like the winning team gets to pick a, pirate, a player. Pirate League. Pirate League. That's the one I was thinking of. Pirate. Yeah, so – I mean, I obviously I listened into the podcast, so kind of if we could do another league, I'd like to really go experimental. So taking Stone's idea of a pirate rate league, which I like, um, so you you go a pirate league, which if you win, you would get to choose choose or steal steal the uh, uh, a player from the team that you faced. However, that losing team. At, or every team before you start the week, you get to essentially lock in a player that can't be stolen. So it kind of, you know, you, you have to play it, play it that way where, you know, if you take your best player, Christian McCaffrey, okay, well, I'm going to lock him in. So they, at least he can't be stolen, but it's still, if you lose free game to anybody else. Um, Quarter, quarterback part included. Of that league, quarterback included. But it's a swap, right? Um, their number one quarterback. Yes, for it would be. Well, I mean, it, I think it would be a fair skill position sw swap. So if you had someone on the bench, say Mac Jones, but you have Josh Allen, or I mean, uh, let's, I guess let's dumb it down. They have Josh Allen, <laughs> you have Jordan Love and Mac Jones. Well, you could swap Mac Jones with, you know, Josh Allen and, you know, they're uh, none the, none the happier. Uh, uh -huh. But, but I think kind of like going experimental. So some of this too, I, I'd like where you don't have a, you don't have a bench at all. Uh, like you really would just rely on your lineup, which would make the stealing even that more like impactful. But the caveat is there may be somebody on the free, you know, free agents that you can pick up via waivers that may be a complete, you know, easy replacement. So I don't know. I, I have a bunch of ideas from like really getting experimental and trying things out. I mean, I, I'm, I tried uh, out a guillotine league this year just through a public site. Um, and I've, I mean, I've enjoyed it. I mean, some of the, you know, people playing, you know, I don't think are very good or is committed. Um, and so I'm like one of the last nine now, which, you know, I think now I'm with the better people. So like, that's been fun. Um, I start or I joined a dynasty league on a whim with just a, you know, random group of people that I don't know. Um, and so that's been like a learning process. Uh, I know, you know, you have dynasty, which is essentially, you know, an entire team of, you know, like, tw you know, you have 25 uh, positions you can fill. Uh, oh, wow. But that's like, you're, you're committed for multiple years and you do like a rookie draft every year. 
um, versus where I think, I don't know if Andy's in a dynasty. I think he's more in a keeper league, uh, but I, I honestly don't, don't know. Um, so I know there's like differences with that. But anyways, I, I mean, at the start of this year, I had way too much time on my hands and I decided to join a couple additional leagues and uh, anyways, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Well, I love it. And listen, I think we should do it next year. We've got four people that are voting members of the GFL right here live. Raise your hand if you're for a separate league of some sort of experimental value. That's one for me. Caleb, two. Patrick, you can just put your penis in the air. We know how big it is. There we go. <laughs> it's a separate league, by the way. It doesn't take away from the mm. main one. Obviously, Joseph said, I know we have Josh Stone who's on board. That's five. We just need two more votes and we can push it through. Um, let's uh, we, are, we, we can't force a whole league to uh, participate. Yeah. Correct. Um, so if we were to do something like that, it would it would get come to adding adding out outside people that are interested in doing something like that. And I think, then I think you could expand it to other people like a Nate Sumner or um, even like Joseph's brother, um, James, mm -hmm. um, if we needed to get it to 10. Um, I got to be honest with you, Patty. I think having a league like. I think most people in the GFL would be on board. I mean, who would say no? I mean, I think I think to Cameron maybe. Here. Um, Cameron might not. Ramos might not. Bell, I don't know. No, Bell's on board. He already said it uh, last okay. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. put it to a vote. I think Joe. the. I think Pat's right. I mean, I think Pat's right though. Like, maybe not everyone wants to do it, but with the experimental league that we would try, there would be no fee, you know, so we're, this is just something we're experimenting on the side, you know, just seeing what everyone thinks. I mean, it could completely flop, you know, everyone doesn't like the mechanics of it. So, I mean, that's, that's why it's experimental in nature. Yeah. Also, it's going to be another league you have to manage. Right. So, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be tough for Joseph, at least year one. He's got two leagues to manage, especially. Let's see. I mean, maybe the experimental league turns out to be the more popular one and people want to join on that one. Maybe we do that full time. Well, let's we'll see. All right. Next thing I want to talk well, about. Let's, let's take it back. Go ahead, Joe. Hang on. Take it, take it back real quick to like our league and just like considerations. Um, so one thing that I did throw out this year, which uh, got put down was the free agent bidding. Um, and I, I'm going to, I mean, I, I really like, I know it seems scary to actually have to bid on players uh, from a waiver perspective, but to me, this also like you, you, it adds a additional strategy than just a pure, you know, waiver order, which is, you know, once you use it, you drop to the bottom, like, here you you know submit a bid on a player and let's see who was early in the year we could use puka N nakua who i mean nobody drafted and you know it, i i'm not sure i guess uh, we have him on our team so and i, I don't think i even submitted a, a waiver we submitted a waiver on him i picked him off free agency um so i mean that may still happen but I mean, if there was three people interested, it would come down to a dollar amount. So, you know, you could say you have a hundred dollars to, to, to bid throughout the year. And, you know, you got to use that strategically and say, you know, he's that he could potentially be that valuable where he's a every, you know, every week player and you're going to spend 30% of your budget. So $30. Well, you also have to consider that, well, there could be, X number of other, you know, teams that want him and well, maybe 30 is not enough. Maybe it needs to be 35. I know uh, Andy used the example of, you know, his guillotine league where, you know, Pat Mahomes, the second week was like, you know, it was 103, 102, 101. I mean, it, it adds another layer of strategy, which I think is, you know, 
is needed instead of just, oh, you know, I don't want to use my my waiver because I'm holding on to the top spot. Joe, I, I love it. Here, here's my thing, day. right? You're Sorry to cut you off. It adds another layer of complexity and another layer of time. You need to put more time into this to figure out what you're going to bid. I would be on board personally mm -hmm. if there was a $100 buy-in, okay, and an additional 100 for waivers. So the entire investment per year is $200. Then that boosts the winnings up to $1,500, which is a little bit more sexy for me. And also, you know, I don't know. That's the way I would do it personally. But if so, you want to add this, so, go ahead, Patrick. One thing, um, and we, I, I've talked to James about it doing it in our league where you, the total submissions would be $200, but whatever you don't spend in your waiver money, you would get back. So that, that's one way you could do it. But I, I also like the bidding because for one, it, the teams that are at the bottom of the league, that they have no chance to claim a waiver pick in our um, kind of snake order of doing it. Um, it gives them a chance at getting some of those top waivers, but it also, uh, I'm not going to say evens the playing field, but there are certain people that stay up till three o'clock in the morning and pick off those guys that aren't claimed off of waivers they get the and i know that they're they're doing it's what i used to do it's what i did whenever i won the league but uh it would get rid of that to where it would make things a little a little more fair i think um because i'm not staying up till three o'clock to claim guys off of waivers uh first so there's not enough money involved for that you know yeah in my opinion, if the purse was bigger, of course, yeah, I would maybe consider it. But yeah, he got bucks. me on one that with uh, this week. I waited off of a waiver to try and get uh, golf. I like this matchup, and Pete. It said that he he picked him up off a of free agency at like two thirty in the morning. I'm like, that's Pete's no, game, dude. There's no yeah. way I'm getting up that early. That's yeah. Pete's game, man. He just stays up later. Yeah, so. I, I don't think have it sets an alarm. Stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I'm running. I'm running two companies. I can't stay up till two thirty every night or whatever it is. You know, for you guys as yeah. well. But it would get rid of that aspect of it if you went well, to the auction, and that's why I support it. That's what I want to know is why does the waiver hit at two thirty in the morning? Like, what is that time set? Why does it not hit at like eight o'clock? It's ESPN's default. Um, I mean, we would have to move to a different platform for I could set it set it to you know, 9 a.m. Central. Um, right. But I don't necessarily want to move. And then, to it, and then you have everybody sitting there trying to click on the guys at the exact same time. <laughs> yeah. And then get... there's more car accidents and shit on the way to work. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick's going to have to hire more EMS for Gerald. Yeah, I don't know. Look, Patrick, can you explain in more detail how the auction system or whatever it is the bidding system will prevent people staying up all night how does it work no it, it, well because you, you can justin may be able to explain it uh well than me well i mean also like i guess just auction auction when <clears throat> i mean i guess it is auction every week but i don't know just technical terms here auction is typically the like what you do in a redraft league at the start you know, you're auctioning off players where the week to week waiver system is a free agent bidding. So you're just, you know, putting a, a bid bid out there, which is, I mean, I guess auction at the end of the day, but just like technical terms. So we don't get them mixed up. Um, but yeah, the, the free, free agent bidding and, and sorry, X, what was your question exactly? My question is, so now currently in the in current day, right? He can stay up till two 30 in the morning. He's looking at Pornhub. Five minutes later, he pops off, drafts some free agents at 2.33 in the morning, whatever it is. How does this system that Patrick's talking about prevent that? So it won't it won't prevent that. It's not going to prevent that, you know, him still staying up because you're you're still going to run, you know, the waiver is going to run via bidding system. And then it'll clear 
clear up, you know, you can still add free agents for free, right? whatever, the rest of the week. But it gives you a clear opportunity to submit a bid for anybody for whatever price you want to pay. So instead of worrying about what is your, you know, waiver order position and losing that, well, now you have, you know, free opportunity to submit a $2 bid on Jared, Jared Goff because, you know, you need a quarterback next week instead of waiting until that week or, you know, what, what have you. So like, I, I, it just gives you a, a better opportunity to grab players that you would not necessarily grab in a traditional waiver system. Right. And it also lets you beat the waiver or, waiver order, right? Because you yes. can just, if you wanted to bet all hundred bucks or whatever it is, then you, you'll definitely get the player. I understand and, that. And then, and then the caveat there is if you tie in a bid, then it, you know, it'll default to the waiver order in in that scenario. But I mean, I've only seen a handful of those ever happen. I guess the downside is if you want to bid on a player that nobody, like Andrew said, <laughs> he put uh, $70 on Christian McCaffrey and nobody else bid, then you lose your 70 bucks. And that's the downside mm -hmm. to it, right? There's some risk to it too. So you can jump the line, yes. but also you can lose your, uh... okay. Yep. All right. I'd be on board. I, yeah. If it takes away powers from Pete, I'm definitely on board. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, I think it just gives a more fair advantage across the board and you know you don't have to feel like you're wasting your waiver position to just you know select a player every week and and also you can do a minimum like you can just do a minimum bid like you could we could set it at one dollar dollar where you know if you're you want somebody you don't necessarily um think that anybody will grab them well you can set a minimum bid of one dollar and you're probably going to grab them you don't have to worry about you know someone stealing them once waivers waivers clear and you know grab them for free i mean i know you know i, I know it adds another strategy to it that not everyone may may want to you know delve into but i don't know i i think i think it'd be good well i think if you brought it to the table you get enough votes in my opinion We'll probably run it. We, we got four. We did. Right it. We, we voted it. Voted it out last. You know, this past season, and it got yeah uh, pushed. But we can try it again. Yeah, I think I think the podcast helps because we can talk about it at length. Uh, what the hell is Caleb doing over there? I'm seeing up your shorts, Caleb. For God's sakes! <laughs> this guy, his dedication is top notch. I got to tell you. Patrick had to get another cold beer. Let's go, Pat. Patrick, why yes, ask you? What are you drinking? Me? Yeah. Light. Oh, dude. A delicious light beer. Oh, yes. That is yeah, not Bud Light. light. Patrick, or excuse me, Joseph, you'll be very proud of me. Today, I went to a business meeting, and I closed the deal. And the guy was serving me Johnny Walker. Okay. Black label, 12 years aged, and he gave me one. And I said, this is the most delicious whiskey I've ever had in my life. And I loved it so much. He gave me the entire bottle. Dang. I didn't drink That's... the whole thing, by the way. But like, <laughs> I tasted it and I said, my God, that's hey, great. Bro. And so I took the whole thing. That's uh, scotch whiskey, right? It's scotch whiskey, but I got to tell you, I hate scotch. I fucking hate scotch. I, I would piss on yeah. scotch if I could, but this well, is so it's blended good scotch. That's why. That's, this one here, I told him, I was like, dude, I have never liked anything with scotch in my life. This one is really good. So that's what I'm drinking right now. Aaron Bell would be ashamed of me as he's been sober for <laughs> two years or so, but yeah. Patrick, give us an update on uh, mayor life. Everybody knows you're the most powerful man in Gerald, Texas. I talked to Andrew Sumner on the podcast. Maybe you heard, maybe you didn't. Maybe you uh, tuned off before he talked about your achievements, but he said, Patrick's doing a bang up job. He said, Patrick's doing a great job. And uh, Andrew Sumner doesn't lie. Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's been interesting. Um, it was pretty rough the first uh, six or so months whenever we had an interim police, interim police chief and uh, interim city manager. Uh, that was pretty tough. But uh, things have gotten, I say, better once we hired uh, our new city manager, which is actually, um, her name's Danielle Singh, but it's Danielle Cantler. It's Mallory's sister. She's, she's phenomenal. A strategic hire, a strategic hire. Well done. Very much so. Yeah, I had to uh, con one of my council members to uh, get her, get her uh, hired, but uh, yeah, it was worth it. Yeah, I know. I remember I talked to you last time. You had to shift some things around, maybe cut a job here to be able to afford the salary for Danielle. But we all know she's smart. She comes from a long bloodline of geniuses. So uh, I think you did well there. And dividends from that, from what Andrew said, it's paying off. Oh, 100%. Uh, she's reworking our whole budget and actually... Uh, She found out that we were spending about 70% of our property taxes. We're going to pay off utility debt that we had, where utility services should be funding and paying off utility debt. And so she's worked it to now, we got that down to 54%. Um, and we got some things we're gonna do, a uh, utility rate study to get that down to zero. Um, but by getting that down, we were able to, we're doing a whole Christmas thing in Old Town with a 26 foot tree and lights. What's Old Town, by the way? <clears throat> so just Main Street of Gerald, uh, you know, there's where the old fire station used to be, the new one is now, uh. There's been people that have tried to shift or build uh, a new, like, downtown center of Gerald. And so, yeah, we're trying to revitalize uh, that main part of Gerald that everybody knows that's lived here. Where, where have they been trying to move that new downtown area to? So there's been different ideas, uh, but more along where like 487 area, they've proposed ideas because they built the Brookshire over there. And so it's more newer people that have moved in that don't really care about the old downtown area and they're wanting to try and build something completely new. Um, and we're, we're more thinking about trying to revitalize uh, that main street of Gerald there and keep that where uh, we want to bring in new businesses. And then when we do have like a Christmas parade or um, anything like that, that's where we would have it. Well, I would I would support that because I mean, as kids, right? Remember the street dances at the, at oh, the yeah. firehouse there, man. That was just so much fun. And also, it's just historic. I think everybody knows there used to be a train track ran right down that main street, right? So you try to stay true to your roots if you can. And also, it's a little bit closer to thirty five. I know it's around the corner of the area that you're talking about, but it's not quite the same. No, not at all. Um... And I honestly thought that it was going to take a couple of years before we'd actually have money to uh, do anything like a Christmas event or 4th of July event. But uh, what's the update Danielle, on Disney? What's the update on Disney or not Disney? Uh, yeah. Is it Disney or who was it? Uh, yeah. The retirement home or the. Uh, so there uh, that project is going to take a long time to actually get. Get a, like to start uh -huh. um, there to be any progress. It's such a big development and there's um, a lot of stuff they have to get figured out. And so the main thing is water to start anything like that. You got to have a shit ton of water. And so they're kind of waiting on that right now. Um, 
there's also talks on the other side of the interstate. Um, you know where Sweatner Farms is? Yeah. Uh, they have about 40,000 acres, and the owner of Sweatner Farms, he's created a, a mud district there, and he's trying to put in um, a development like the domain with like higher end retail and uh, businesses surrounded by developments and stuff like that. And so he's, I don't know the exact timeline on it, but that's what he's wanting to do. Um, so in five or 10 years, Gerald could be, who knows what. So current population is what, Patrick? Just in the city limits, 4,000 or so. Okay, let, let's, 4,000 people? Just inside, yeah, right. inside, inside the city limits. Right, let's let's count everything else because Gerald, you know, goes to uh, Corn Hill and all these other places. What is like the whole city? Within a the... five mile radius, probably 25,000. 25,000, okay. 40, uh, Georgetown, when I was a kid, it was 40,000, so we're not far off. And then what do you project Gerald to grow? Because you guys are what, 4A now? 5A? 4A? They redid the the districts. Um, and so I think what used to be a 2A is now a 3A or something like that. Yeah. But it's uh, inflation, right inflation, now. Patrick. <laughs> right. Right. It's a 4A right now. Okay. You're a 4A, technically a 3A. And what do you project five, 10 years from now? Because, you know, it's amazing. You're a mayor of a city that is so close to Austin. And Austin is, um, yeah, going to replace San Francisco, going to replace Seattle, in my opinion. Maybe not fully, but at least by interest level. Uh, I think it's super cool. So what do you project five, 10 years out? So uh, we have about 21,000 houses on our books right now that we have agreed to supply either water or wastewater to. Um, not all of those are inside the city limits, but um, a good majority of them are. And those, those developments, they are projected out five years, but it'll probably, probably be five to 10 years by the time all of those should be built. So um, I think they say they average out like 3.5 seven residents per household or something like that so you could do the math on 25 or twenty one thousand houses times 3.7 so that's kind of wow. what crazy. we're what we're looking at yeah and everybody talks in terms of inner city outer city but the way i look at it in terms of you know looking at city growth is taxpayers so whether you're inner city or outer city, you're going to be paying taxes to the city of Gerald, which is Patrick Sheridan. Give that man your money. He's doing well. Um, that's awesome, dude. Uh, all right. So I'm going to shift real quick. I know we're, by the way, guys, I know I'm keeping you late here. It's already an hour plus. I'm just going to share my screen real quick to talk about crypto. Who's excited about risky investments? I am. I am. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, listen, there's a couple different things going on with crypto, and I think everybody should pay attention. I'm not saying invest a lot of money. Um, look, here's the deal. Crypto is getting regulated, which is a very good thing for a lot of different people, especially the sovereign wealth funds of Saudi Arabia, institutional investors. Um, when crypto becomes regulated, that means that big money, trillions of dollars will flow into the system uh, with confidence. OK, this could be three trillion dollars or so. Uh, in my opinion, now is a very important time to pay attention. I don't know what you guys are investing in personally, but this is what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm taking a look at crypto seriously than I ever have. Um, look, so we are at a point where, you know, there's been a lot of travesties in the crypto market. If you look at FTX and all these different stories, yada, yada. But um, we are on the verge of a 
spot ETF being approved. And what a spot Bitcoin ETF means is essentially a fully regulated vehicle for outside investors to put money into crypto. Doesn't mean crypto is the end all be all, but it does mean that outside investors, including institutional Saudi wealth funds, blah, blah, they can invest. Okay. So uh, I believe the process started, let's call it five days ago, roughly. I believe the SEC has like three, four, five more days left to approve or deny. There have been 12 applications. Two have been from BlackRock, by the way, who owns the world. I think they have over like $2 trillion in assets. Uh, they applied for a Bitcoin spot ETF as well as an Ethereum spot ETF. There's 10 other companies that also apply. If any of them get approved, and I would assume it's going to be in batch mode, all 12 get approved at the same time, or all 12 get denied at the same time, uh, all of crypto is going to fucking skyrocket. I, I see Bitcoin doubling very easily with a cap at about 110 before it regresses again. Here's what I'm buying. There's a coin called Alluvium, who is built on the Ethereum network, blah, blah, blah. Um, I see this going, it, let's take a look at the all-time chart. So the all-time price is at right around $1,800. Currently it's at 90 bucks. So you can see it as a, you know, 10 X roughly 15, 20 X, something like that. And here's what I'm, here's where I'm putting my money. So I wanted to ask you as Joseph is a finance guy, Joseph, do you have any, are you, are you tracking the crypto markets? Are you buying gold and treasury bonds? What do you think? No, I, I mean, I don't, I don't invest outside of just general 401k and I let, you know, uh, someone manage that. Um, you know, I, I have some targets that they, you know, try, try to meet, but I don't, I mean, I honestly don't have other free cash flow that I'm just saving for, you know, uh, we don't own a house yet. So still saving for that. Um, and I decided, Investing in those kind of things, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit risky for me. Um, I don't, I don't have, you know, like I said, I don't have that cash just to play around with. So I, I honestly don't have a lot of opinions. Um, I mean, I'm happy for those that can do those kind of things, but I don't have the patience. Patrick, I know, I know you used to Bitcoin mine, at least. Mm. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean it's uh, all of it. All, all of it's risky. Um, I'm not currently in anything. Um, I have some fractions of a Bitcoin that are just sitting there, but uh, yeah, I haven't. I haven't dug too deep into it. Um, once you have kids, you may you may not have as much time to dig very deep into it either. Uh, they kind of get the priority of my time. So, yeah, that's fair. The only reason I've been looking at it recently is because I was very close to buying a boat, and I was going to buy a very nice boat. And you know, I know how much it costs to upkeep a boat, and I was looking at everything about it, and. I was damn, I was damn close. And I looked at my wife and she hates the idea of a boat. She also hates the idea of crypto. Hates it. But I said, at least with crypto, there's upside. So let me put some money in here. So again, as I said in the text, I'm going to drop 20K into Alluvium. I've already put 5K. Currently, I'm down $132.44. I'm looking at it live. But over the next probably month, I'm going to put another 15K in. And uh, yeah, maybe it'll pop up. So the all-time highs it used to be at, let's say the ETFs get approved and I'll be sitting on 360 grand of cash. So anyway, I just want to talk about that because that's what I'm focused on recently. Yeah, I mean, I know I know Bitcoin, their big thing is their, uh, when they, whenever they go through their halving of rewards for the miners. Um, April, 2024. Yeah, it's every, every four years. And so it's not an, an immediate effect, but... Typically within the next year is whenever they have had all their major spikes. Um, because like I said, those rewards for the miners, they could cut in half. And so for them to be profitable to keep running their miners, uh, 
the price has to, has to go up because they're basically they're essentially get their payout is half, and so they have electricity costs and lease costs and costs and all that stuff. So I don't know why it exactly happens. Maybe they quit selling all their re rewards, the the big big mining companies. Um, but you can just track it on the chart. It, they got major spikes within a year after the halving. So watch out for that. Yeah, no doubt. So, so real quick, one chart that I, uh, I thought that was interesting that I took a look at today was this one here. All right. So this is basically a price forecast and the red line uh, shows when you should sell, or at least when the buying pressure is too high. And the orange line here shows when your support level, the support level, it's sort of, yeah, but it's, it's more about the balanced price. And so this chart has been accurate for 10 plus years. Every time it drops below, you should buy. Every time it goes too high, you should sell. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, the main thing is if you look over here on the right, it shows the next price level where you should sell is 110 K roughly. And so we're sitting right now at about 36, 37 grand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's just say alluvium holds tight and that, and Bitcoin goes to 110 grand. I mean, I am buying you guys trips to Serbia. <laughs>